let's take a look at the top five fighters that should have been built. During the long course of its existence, development of fighter planes has provided examples of many dead ends and designs that just didn't work out. By their very nature, fighter aircraft are extremely competitive, and as soon as one is developed, adversaries work out ways to defeat it with both anti-air defenses and newer fighters that can counter the latest design. It is a never-ending game of cat and mouse. However, just like there have been many dead ends, there are also cases when a design should have gone into production, but did not. Today, we will look at five designs that should have gone into production, and the reasons why they didn't. Coming in at number 5, the General Dynamics F-16XL. What started out as a technology demonstrator, soon evolved into a prototype fighter bomber that could perform long-range interdiction missions. Compared to the production F-16, the F-16XL's cranked arrow or double delta wing increased fuel capacity by 82% and allowed it to carry twice the payload while delivering it 40% farther. With an impressive 27 hard points and a 15,000 pound ordnance capacity, the F-16XL would have been a valuable asset to any air force it served with. However, the F-16XL was pitted against the F-15E Strike Eagle in a competition to decide which airplane would ultimately be produced. The F-15E was very similar to the already in production F-15D and so few modifications were needed. By comparison, the F-16XL had both a completely redesigned wing and a lengthened fuselage. This would have incurred substantial costs to get it into production. In the end, with its twin engines and lower initial costs to produce, the F-15E went into production. The two flying examples of the F-16XL did go on to perform many research studies for NASA and the Air Force, and some of that knowledge was applied to the F-22. The F-16XL likely would have done well as an export option, and some argue it would be a relevant airframe even today. In the end, the F-16XL became known as a great idea at the wrong time. Coming in at number 4, we have the Avro Aero. Intended to be a fast, high-altitude interceptor, the CF-105 or Avro Aero was designed and built in Canada and made use of a delta wing design. First revealed to the public in October of 1957, the Avro was intended to be the Royal Canadian Air Force's premier interceptor into the 1960s and beyond. Powered by two Pratt & Whitney J-75 P3 afterburning turbojet engines, the Aero reached speeds of Mach 1.9 at 50,000 feet and was getting ready to be fitted with the Canadian-built Orenda Iroquois engines which would have likely seen its top speed easily surpass Mach 2. This, along with reports from test pilots that the aircraft handled well, seemed to indicate a promising future for the Aero. So why was it never built? During the development of the Aero, two major events occurred that sealed its fate, one internationally and one within Canada. On the same day that the Avro was revealed to the public, the then Soviet Union launched the Sputnik, kicking off the space race. And suddenly, the Air Force not only had to defend threats from the skies, but also from space. As a result, research and spending began to be diverted to countering not just manned bombers, but also ballistic missile threats. Additionally, some in the Canadian government felt that there was not enough money for both a new ballistic missile defense system and a new interceptor. This, along with the election of Prime Minister John Diefenbaker in 1957, quickly changed the prospects of the Aero. In February of 1959, the program was ordered cancelled on a day that is known in Canadian aviation circles as Black Friday. Within two months, all five prototypes, the engines and tooling used to make the Aero were ordered destroyed, and altered the course of Canada's aerospace defense industry. Number 3. The Grumman F-14 Super Tomcat 21 Arguably America's favorite fighter, the F-14 rocketed to public stardom with appearances in movies like The Final Countdown and Top Gun. Designed as an air superiority fleet defender, the F-14 had incredible range, long-range missiles, and an electronics platform to track, lock, and fire on multiple targets. To extend the service life of the F-14 platform, Grumman proposed a Super Tomcat 21 upgrade. The upgrade included an all-new radar suite, upgraded engines that allowed the Tomcat to supercruise. Additionally, a new flight control system with thrust vectoring 
would have further enhanced the Tomcat's maneuverability. To add to this maneuverability, control surfaces were enlarged and fuel capacity was greatly enhanced. This additional fuel capacity would extend even further the Tomcat's legs and give it longer time on station. And finally, the integration of targeting pods would have allowed the Super Tomcat 21 to become a true multi-role precision fighter bomber. So what happened? How could arguably the world's most popular fighter at the time not get much needed upgrades which would have effectively made it into a new fighter, one with unmatched range and speed? The idea of a Super Tomcat 21 had been floated around as early as 1991. And we have to remember, this was after an overwhelmingly decisive victory in the first Gulf War. Congress was under pressure to pay the peace dividend, meaning after years of spending to get the latest and greatest weapons, funds could now be diverted elsewhere. Along with this, the Super Hornet was already in development, which would cost less to operate and promise to have a better mission capable rate. In the end, the Super Tomcat 21 was too much airplane for too much money, and the F-14 was retired in 2006 altogether. Number 2. The Northrop F-20 Tiger Shark Widely considered to be the best fighter that was never built, the F-20 Tiger Shark was an enhanced version of the already successful F-5E Tiger. The F-5 was designed as a low-cost, high-performance fighter bomber and saw wide success as an export aircraft for many nations in the free world. Initially internally funded by Northrop, the F-20 built on the successes of the F-5 and incorporated a single powerful engine, the same one used in the F-18 Hornet. Additionally, the F-20 made use of then state-of-the-art avionics and sensors which allowed it to use virtually every aircraft-based weapon in the US arsenal. Boasting incredible performance and unmatched maneuverability, the F-20 looked like a sure winner, if not for the US Air Force, then as an upgrade to the numerous nations that were using F-5s. So what happened? For starters, the F-16 was already in production and the F-20 was not seen as necessary by the US Air Force. And when the Air Force didn't bite, other nations became skeptical as they did not want to support a fighter that may have had a limited run. Additionally, the F-20 suffered two fatal accidents when its test pilots pushed the airplane beyond their limits and succumbed to G-Lock. In both cases, it was found that the F-20 structure or design were not at fault, but the public relations damage had been done. Still, it is amazing to think that a fighter with the fastest scramble time in the world and used 53% less fuel cost 63% less to maintain and was four times more reliable than any of its contemporaries was not adopted by any Air Force. The irony is that today the F-20 program makes more sense than it did in the 1980s. Miniaturization and electronics allows even the most powerful AESA radars to fit into the F-20's nose. Smart weapons have also gotten smaller and more accurate, meaning that one fighter can do what would have taken two or even four fighters to do 20 years ago. And with many nations still flying F-5Es as their frontline fighters, an F-20 upgrade would be welcome. The concept and some say the design of the F-20 was copied in the JF-17. And as they say, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. Before we get to the top of this list, let's take a look at a couple of honorable mentions. The North American F-107 Today, not many people know about the North American F-107, which was a product of the 1950s fighter-bomber competition. The F-107 utilized some innovative features and had excellent performance for its time. A derivative of the successful F-100 Sabre, the YF-107 was informally referred to as the Ultra Sabre, and those who worked on it referred to it as the Man Eater due to its unusual location of the air intakes. The idea behind the F-107 was to create a Mach 2 fighter bomber that could carry both conventional and nuclear bombs. Interestingly, the F-107 had semi-recessed hardpoints to streamline the airplane even while carrying ordnance. The most innovative feature of the F-107 was the use of a variable area inlet duct or evade system. This allowed for very efficient performance and is today considered an early form of variable intake ramps, which are in use today in aircraft like the F-15. 
Ultimately, the F-107 lost out to the F-105 Thunder Chief, or THUD as it became known. The F-105 itself was a good airplane, having seen extensive use in Vietnam. And although both the F-105 and F-107 used the same engine, the Pratt & Whitney YJ-75 P9 turbojet, and the competition itself was close, in the end the F-105 was chosen to go into production. Given its early variable geometry intakes, who knows how much quicker fighter design may have progressed had the F-107 gone into production. Another honorable mention goes to the Rockwell RPRV-870 HIMAT or Highly Maneuverable Aircraft Technology. The HIMAT was an experimental technology demonstrator developed by NASA to test future technologies for fighters. The HIMAT explored features such as composite materials, close coupled canards, and all digital flight controls. With its first flight all the way back in 1979, the design still looks modern today. The aircraft was remotely piloted as it was deemed too risky to risk a pilot's life during testing. Interestingly, although the aircraft was controlled from the ground, a manned F-104 Starfighter was also used as a chase plane, which carried backup remote controls in case the ground station lost signal. The HIMATS data analysis led to the X-29 and helped pioneer the use of composites in both military and civilian aircraft, which see wide use today. Can you imagine if this design had proceeded to the manned flight stages and production? Alright, we've gone through the previous four aircraft and have worked our way to number one. Without further ado, number one, the Northrop YF-23 Black Widow. For some of the airplanes on this list, when it came down to a competition, you could argue that ultimately the better airplane won and the other airplane would have been a nice to have or could have taken developments in a new direction. However, in the case of the competition between Northrop's YF-23 and Lockheed's YF-22, many feel that the better airplane lost. In a debate that still rages to this day, the YF-22 was chosen and went on to become the F-22 Raptor that we all know. And while the Lockheed F-22 is an amazing airplane, the YF-23 was faster, more stealthy, and almost just as maneuverable without thrust vectoring. So why did the YF-23 lose the competition? For starters, the YF-22 was a more conventional design and seen as less of a risk to mass produce. The other reason, and perhaps the deciding factor, was public relations. The Lockheed team conducted a demonstration flight of a high angle of attack maneuver while the Northrop team decided not to do so. And even though the YF-23 could perform the same maneuver, by not demonstrating it, the implication was that the YF-22 could perform the maneuver while the YF-23 could not. Additionally, although not a requirement of the test program, the Lockheed team also conducted a live fire exercise of an AIM-9 Sidewinder and an AIM-120 AMRAAM missile from the internal weapons bay. This was seen as going above and beyond what was necessary for testing and made a favorable impression on the evaluators. The rest is history. The YF-22 went on to become the production F-22 and the two YF-23 prototypes Black Widow and Grey Ghost were put away and now reside in museums. To this day, many consider the YF-23 way ahead of its time. Finally, development has already started on a replacement for the F-22, and if the concept art for the proposed new 6th generation fighter looks familiar, well, that kind of tells you all you need to know about the YF-23, doesn't it? What do you think? Should some of these aircraft have been produced? Are there aircraft that should have been on this list? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Aviation history is full of many what ifs and could haves. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Stay safe everyone, and see you next time.